Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is John Torpy. I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the City University of New York Graduate School and University Center, usually known as the Graduate Center. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Beth Novak, who is professor at uh, Northeastern University where she directs the Burns Center for Social Change and its partner project, the Governance Lab, aka the Gov Lab, and its MacArthur Research Network on Opening Governance. She's the author of a recent book, Solving Public Problems, How to Fix Our Government and Change Our World, which was published by Yale University Press in 2021. Uh, and the book was named a best book of 2021 by the Stanford Social Innovation Review. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, my governor as it happens, uh, appointed her as the state's first chief innovation officer and chair of the state's future of work task force. And between 2018 and 2021, she served on German Chancellor Angela Merkel's Digital Council. So. Uh, I need to tell you that we're going to be recording this event, so please take a moment to anonymize yourself if you wish to do that. We will share the video from the discussion after the event, uh, as well as putting out the, uh, uh, the audio of the interview with Professor Novick as an episode of our podcast, uh, which is called International Horizons. You can find International Horizons on the New Books Network or uh, of academic podcasts, as well as on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And so we'll begin with an interview uh, that'll last about 45 minutes or so, and then open up uh, you know, the Q&A. And if you have questions for Professor Novick, please put them in the, uh, in the chat, which we are using for today's uh, Q&A. So, Professor Novick, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you with us, and to discover John. that we have that to discover that we have lots of people in our past in common that we didn't know we had. Um, but in any case, we're going to mainly talk about your book, and um, you know, it seems to me the book reads like a kind of antidote, at least to some of the causes of uh, right wing populism. Uh, which is in part a response to the sense that people don't have a say in government decision making, I would say. The pollsters at Pew have found public trust in government in the U.S. near historic lows recently. Uh, the media are held in low regard, etc. Uh, poor governance tends to promote skepticism about government, uh, which in turn fuels unhappiness with elites and hence, you know, populism and extremism. So could you talk a bit about the relationship in your work between citizens' loss of trust in government and government institutions and effective government? John, thank you so much for having me here today. And we have uh, current people also in common, Leah and Merrill. I want to thank them for enabling me to be here. Uh, it's Leah's persistent attendance at the lecture series that I ran for many years called uh, Reimagining Democracy, uh, where we try to solve a lot of the challenges that you just mentioned um, that's led to my being able to be here today. So I appreciate that very much. Um, and I think you've hit the nail on the head exactly in terms of what motivated the writing of this book, which is this declining trust in government uh, rates of trust at their lowest ebb and continuing to decline in, at least in modern democracies. Of course, we see the opposite in some authoritarian regimes, which is even perhaps more frightening. Um, but I think that while there are many root causes to the predisposition to authoritarianism, predisposition now to also the rise of new authoritarian leaders, a new playbook around election subversion and election denial that we're seeing in this country, and there are again myriad root causes at play, one of the big issues here is the fact that people don't trust government because government doesn't deserve to be trusted. Um, and that is because government is not as effective as it needs to be in addressing the challenges of our time. So you only need to open the paper this week and to see again, my son reminded me this morning that The Onion put out yet again the headline uh, that they do every time there's a mass shooting 
uh, and they do this every single time, meant to drive home the reminder. Uh, I've forgotten the funny headline. That's the unfortunately never good to start something where you don't know the punchline. Um, but that we are not addressing challenges, whether it's gun violence, whether it's climate change, whether it's COVID, as we've seen in public health crises uh, or other existential threats. We're not as good as we need to be at solving these problems. And then at just the very micro level, um, you know, we're not doing as good a job as we need to even to distribute resources that we have. So where we have benefits, where we have services, you know, they're not getting into people's hands and we're not doing as much as we can to improve people's lives. Of course, let me be clear that there are many things that we're doing right and there's compared to a generation ago, it's not that things are necessarily worse on some me measures. In many ways, we're doing better, but we're not doing as well as we need to. And so the essence of the book, to long story short, is to say that we can make government more effective if we can train people to work differently in government. And that's what it's about. It's about, you know, very pedantically, it's a book about upskilling. It's about the need to invest in training the public sector workforce, as well as the private sector workforce and others in solving problems in new ways. So the book is really meant not to be exclusively, I should say, about government, although it is, uh, based on my experience, largely focused on that, but really about a learnable set of skills for solving problems in the world, for taking a project for, from idea to implementation, a set of skills that I think is only going to expand and grow with the new AI tools that are available to us today. But let me pause with that and say, spot on. Um, and my hope is that if we can make government more effective, we can restore more trust in government, which will help to stave off the sense of insecurity uh, and chaos that leads to people's susceptibility to authoritarianism. Right. Great. So maybe you could tell us about, you know, what those skills are. You said it's all about upskilling and certain kinds of skills that people need to effectively address public problems. But what, what skills do you have in mind? So the skills that I'm talking about uh, and, you know, skills is really in, I, and I say the word skills intentionally to make this specific, concrete and practical so that it feels very so that it feels doable. Um, but in many ways, and it takes us from the world of political theory and conversations about more engagement in government in the world of theory into talking about what does that mean in practice? So the skills I'm talking about really have to do with, first and foremost, how do we engage with communities in solving problems, number one, and how do we use data to help us complement that qualitative understanding of what problems are and what the solutions could be to help us come up with better problems? So data and people, really nothing more than that. But in as a practical matter, what I see as somebody who both sits in the academy and in government is that we pay lip service to participatory democracy, but in practice, people don't know how to do it. And now with the tools available, the methods are out there, they're well honed, it really comes down to learning how. Um, so I see lots of interest among people. And I just had conversations about this yesterday um, you know, people on, I was talking to somebody who uh, is, is, trains people in what's often called human-centered design, an idea that's been borrowed from the design discipline, that's been borrowed from the arts in many ways, that's been borrowed from business, the notion of saying we should talk to our customers to understand their problems as we design products for them. And so now we're, that's been borrowed into policy and government to say, we need to actually talk to the people we're serving to understand their challenges and co-design services and policies with them. So that all sounds very well and good. And again, I would say now everybody understands those concepts. If I said human-centered design, people have heard of that term. If I say co-creation, people have heard of that term. But what that means in practice in terms of actually doing it is not so simple. So coming back to your question, the skills, the, the core skills in my view are the ability to define a problem, both using data, using quantitative evidence and qualitative evidence, engaging with communities, the ability to source solutions. Uh, again, using technology to help us get smarter quickly from sources that are out there about what's already worked. Learning how to partner with other people and across sectors to be able to undertake partnerships that can allow us to get more done more quickly. Learning a set of research skills that allow us to learn quickly, again, what works, what's out there. Skills like 
uh, the increasingly popular skill of learning how to design a behavioral insight, how to draw from the research literature about human behavior, what changes people's behaviors so that you can use that to transform services and policies and also how to measure what works. So I outline, I'm, I'm just sketching these very briefly here, but I outline a couple, uh, I, I outline a longer list of skills, but that all come down to ways of using data and engagement with communities at each stage of a policy making or problem solving process, whether it's defining the problem, looking for solutions, implementing solutions or measuring what works at each stage, we can look at how we can get better and smarter and more democratic uh, at how we do things than we've done in the past. So I guess I'm sort of uh, not entirely clear about one thing. There are three, let's say, general kind of categories of actors in a political system, the politicians, the bureaucracies, people who are not elected, but who are in the government and the citizenry. And I mean, who needs to, you know, learn about these skills or is this the idea that everybody should be doing this or who is this really intended for? So I would say it is intended for everybody because I think unless you are, uh, let's take each one of them in turn very briefly. So the primary people with responsibility for delivery of solutions, if you will, for delivery of policies and services, et cetera, are the bureaucrats uh, in, in any organization. And again, whether this is a government organization or a business or a nonprofit, there are the day-to-day -day people who are responsible for designing and implementing projects, shall we say. Um, and so I think it's extraordinarily important for them to transform how they work. And that represents a significant departure especially in government from how we've done things in the past, where previously secrecy has been prized, working behind closed doors. We've had a very expert vision of the bureaucrat as the you know, uh, anointed professional in the sort of Weberian conception of this Mandarin who possesses all the expertise and will make this decision shielded from influence that will allow them to make a fairer decision uh, um, uh, that will be you know, in people's best interest, the sort of best and brightest concept. And I think we've long come to understand, uh, as David Halberstam pointed out a long time ago, that the best and brightest are not always in the best position to make decisions. We now know that the person sitting behind closed doors in a bureaucracy does not have the best information at their fingertips, that they're under-resourced in terms of the ability to uh, understand either problems or even solutions that are out there. Um, and that even if they're able to come up with a great idea, it may lack legitimacy and therefore be difficult to implement if they're not engaged with the communities they're trying to serve. For the citizens, even so, if even if we create bureaucrats and therefore institutions that are better at listening and learning and engaging, we need citizens, we need individuals, communities, organizations, interest groups to have the ability to do the speaking. So they also need to have similar kinds of skills for engaging with institutions in ways that, are, that go beyond manning the barricades to actually be able to work together with institutions to come up with solutions that improve people's lives. And we need politicians who are cognizant of the way that we need to solve problems with communities. I think it's extraordinarily important for political leaders to know that they shouldn't, that, and, and I'll, you know, in Canada, for example, there are various uh, ministers in Canada uh, across certain states who have changed how they do things where they say, you cannot give me a proposal, you cannot give me a policy unless it's backed up with evidence that you have used data, that you have engaged with communities, that you've engaged with the academic research literature, that you uh, have essentially an evidence base to support what you're doing. So we need politicians who are making demands of other the other two sectors to ensure that they are putting forward proposals that are actually going to succeed. So I'm interested also in this uh, issue of what, what are public problems? What, what makes for a public problem? I mean, it, it occurs to me that in thinking about that term that, uh, you know, feminism, second wave feminism famously redefined in a certain sense what private or public problems were and said the, the personal is political and, you know, how do you how do you draw that line and, and how how did that, you know, how did feminism change in a way what we think about as public? How is that defined? How does it get on an agenda as a public problem? 
So that's a really, um, so the, 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 the connection to second wave feminism is a really interesting question that no one has ever asked me before. So I'll, I'll answer it, but then I also wanna hear your answer to your own question. Um, let me say first why I chose the term and sort of what it's a reaction to in part. Um, and part of the book and, and uh, one of the terms I use in the book a lot is the term public entrepreneurship. Now, I did not coin that term. That term was coined by Eleanor Ostrom, the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist in, uh, in her dissertation um, that really looked at uh, the entrepreneurial spirit within the public sector and how public sector solves problems. Um, but I chose that term in particular, coming starting with the, uh, that, um, to subvert in some way the relentless emphasis on private entrepreneurship that universities have been investing in over the last two decades. So we have seen an explosion in terms of the number of programs and courses. I'm sure you have them, we have them that are focused on entrepreneurship, um, which are all about, which is all about how the private sector solves problems. It's all about market problems. It's all about how do I get rich? Maybe there's some emphasis on social entrepreneurship. So maybe I can do, do well by doing good, you know, charity water, or I can sell a product, Tom's shoes. Uh, where I sell a product, where I give something back. But there has essentially been very much a focus on market-based solutions to problems that are driven by the profit motive. So I was interested first and foremost in saying, look, that there are problems that are out there that many people would refer to as wicked problems, where there is no clear consensus about what the problem even is. And especially in this highly fractured political environment, we may disagree that there even is a problem. Um, there is definitely no agreement about what the solution is, um, and there's no agreement about how to get between the, between the problem and the solution. Um, so these problems that exist in a highly politicized environment um, and that affect societal outcomes and that are driven by not just micro but meso and macro conditions and forces are really what I'm talking about when I refer to public problems. And I um, want to make very clear that, that although I commit this sin uh, repeatedly, you can't actually solve public problems. They are problems that change and morph as soon as you try to tackle them. Um, and again, we can make often incremental progress, but we very often do, we're, you know, we're not going to solve climate change and gun violence by Christmas. Um, so it's very much intended to provoke some discussion about these kinds of problems, but it's also meant to focus the conversation on, uh, as they say, doing stuff that matters and working on the solutions that in the end are about improving other people's lives rather than simply about getting rich or making a buck and are not limited to market-based solutions. Um, so it's meant to subvert the sort of very um, prevalent discussion about entrepreneurship. And I'm having a little bit of success, although with uh, great patience in my own university, where we're trying to remake the entrepreneurship curriculum, working with our colleagues in the business school to reinvent how we teach that topic and what we mean by that to include a focus on institutions, to include a discussion of the role of government and very much to focus on um, public and wicked problems, which above all are what students I'm seeing are very much interested in. And all the data shows that millennials want to do stuff that matters. They want to work for employers that um, have a social good dimension. They want to make a difference in their own communities. And so uh, the, the long and the short of it is that this is just about problems in political context, um, the solution to which can improve the lives of individuals and communities. So let me put it back to you for a second, John, if I can ask you for more about uh, the question, uh, if I'm allowed to do that, because I'm really interested in the feminist angle here. Sure. Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the idea was simply that uh, in, you know, second wave feminism was simply that there were problems that were not dealt with on the public agenda because they were not seen essentially, I guess, as worthy 
of being seen at that level or in that in that context. And you know, it, I, I think what it primarily did was to change the um, kind of the dividing line, the the line between the public and the private. And, you know, not altogether unproblematically. I mean, I remember Eastern Europeans, some of whom we know in common, uh, you know, who lived through a system in which the dividing line between public and private was also drawn, you know, rather problematically. And so they were not necessarily all that enthusiastic about what they, you know, understood this feminism to be. But the other issue is simply that, uh, you know, as you know from the political science literature, one of the things about power is whether or not things are put on the public agenda or not at all, right? And that that's a kind of crucial uh, way of exercising power is to s keep certain kinds of problems simply off the agenda. Um, and, and, but I think, you know, the point you make about the, that problems don't get solved in, in some, you know, absolute kind of sense or in the, in the ways that those words seem to suggest. And I think that's worth, you know, uh, elaborating on really. I mean, that, uh, I was listening to something yesterday on, on NPR, WNYC, in which, uh, you know, the commissioner of whatever she's called, commissioner of sanitation, I think, in New York is, you know, moving the set out times for garbage. And, you know, what inevitably is going to happen is maybe it will help reduce the rat population, but there will be, you know, knock on or knock on effects or or unintended consequences of this that, you know, nobody has yet foreseen or perhaps were, you know, foreseen and, you know, they're deciding to go ahead with this plan anyway, because they think it's the best approach to dealing with the most, you know, salient problem right now, which is rats. Uh, but I think the point you make that, you know, it's not really, you don't really solve these things. They don't really go away forever and always. They, you know, they sort of bump up against other things and create different kinds of, you know, as we might now say, challenges rather than problems. Um, so I think that's an important point to make. And, you know, nonetheless, uh, we do have this problem that, as you say, launched the writing of this book, which is that a lot of people are very unhappy with government and they feel like it doesn't speak to their you know, needs. And I, I do think the bureaucracies are often you know, the target because they're the permanent actor, right? The politicians come and go. But as we know from Weber, the, the bureaucracy is more or less permanent. And so those people have a certain level of power and a kind of, you know, tenure in office often uh, that makes them a target of unhappiness. And I think that's, you know, part of what's going on in the scenario that, as you say, led you to write this book. So I think that the, um, I'll pick, I just want to pick up on a couple of things you said here in, in no particular mm -hmm. order. Uh, uh, starting with the rats, um, uh, uh, which is that at some level also one of the uh, kind of questions here, especially as we think about power, is just reducing the granularity of the conversation um, to say we need to focus on these very uh, small things sometimes that we can do. It's not that the discussion about uses of data or engagement has to be limited by virtue of it involving community engagement only to small things like what time we take out the trash um, and that we can't have more ambitious plans to how we take back New York from the rats or uh, uh, as she's now become famous for the new commissioner of sanitation. Um, but it is about saying that new kinds of actors, including the most marginalized communities have a voice in how we define what the problems are and the solutions that we can come up with. And their expertise, our expertise as individuals, as community members, um, is as valid and as important as that of either the mandarins in the bureaucracy or even in the academy uh, is that is taking things down from the level of these large impossible geopolitical conversations into saying everyday people's experience matters, right? So there's, this is the everyday bureaucracy conception is that my experience, for example, if I am a sufferer of a disease, let's say I have, I don't know, diabetes, 
that automatically makes me a certain kind of expert in diabetes, in managing my condition. Or I just finished a book by a law professor named Orly Lobel, and she begins the book um, starting immediately with her experience as the parent of a child with, uh, um, with diabetes and all the things they have to do to manage her condition and what that's taught them about what it means to be a sufferer of this disease and how that's helped them to devise solutions to manage the child's care. Um, so this kind of everyday experience gives people remarkable expertise in navigating all kinds of situations and we're missing out institutionally in tapping into that expertise. Um, and so that's a lot about empowerment and it's a lot about empowering um, undervalued know-how, practical experience, day-to-day -day lived experience that we have previously viewed as um, unimportant, frankly. I mean, we don't compensate a lot of that work. We don't, uh, you know, we don't value it in an economic sense either, but we're also not valuing it. And that the academy, I think, is very complicit also in some of that work. And, and I will say that um, I think that the academy in particular, a lot of people who have worked on, ironically, democratic deliberation and engagement um, have played a role in reducing and distrusting the role of citizens in the process because we have for so long in the academy talked about deliberate about the role of citizens as simply deliberating in the church basement, but never about how citizens could actually set the agenda, could actually wield real power, could actually spend real money. And then you fast forward today to experiments and things like participatory budgeting, where across now thousands of communities around the world to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, including the, the kiosks, the Link NYC kiosks now everywhere are talking about participatory budgeting and how ordinary citizens can actually spend money and decide what we spend it on or how in Iceland, you know, a fifth of the population in Reykjavik is helping to choose the issues that every month the mayor gets to vote on or in Taiwan, 250,000 citizens are helping to write legislation. You know, the, the real, the practitioners are showing that citizens can do something very, very different and that's much more powerful, frankly, than academics have credited people with before, I think. Um, you know, many exceptions to that, people who focus obviously on activism and on communities. I think people in sociology have been much um, more effective at really looking at the power of communities more so than I fear in disciplines like political science, I would say. So I'll put that out there. Those might be, might be a provocative concept, but uh, I'll throw it out there. Well, that's interesting, not least because I'm going to Reykjavik in about three months, so I'll I'll look around and see what I can see of what you're describing. But, you know, in the meantime, I'm sort of uh, intrigued. You know, I mentioned in your in the introduction that you had worked on a digital council for uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And you've had other experiences with government in New, New, New Jersey as well. And so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which you were, I'm assuming this was, you know, work rather than field work, so to speak. Um, but I'm curious how your experience in government, you know, helped inform what's in the book. So a lot of my focus has been on um, and ironically, so you and I were talking earlier uh, about um other topics about historical topics. And I'll tell you, it, it's very much related to this because I'm a student of history and have always been interested in the question of what makes for uh, strong democratic institutions, what comes causes some institutions to succeed and other institutions to break uh, under the weight of economic or other forces. Um, and so it's because of this longstanding interest in institutions and also an interest in the fact or a recognition of the fact that institutions are where the power resides. They have the budgets, they have the convening power, um, they have the decision-making authority that I have for a long time been interested in the way that institutions work and the way that people inside institutions work, which is where what makes this book different from other work that I've done before. In the past, I've written about institutions and democratic engagement, and this book is again very tactical and practical about the individuals within those organizations. Again, not limited to government. Um, but I think without changing the institutions, if we only work from the outside, and there are many wonderful people doing work, for example, to create the tools for engagement, or 
obviously many people now thinking about how do we use data to solve problems and how do we create the machine learning tools that help us to ingest and make sense of that data so that we can spot you know, patterns in the traffic or patterns in our weather and how it changes or patterns in public health and the disparate impact uh, um, for uh, communities based on race or gender or economic status. So all of that work is extraordinarily important, but we have to connect it back to the way that institutions spend money and wield power, because in the end, that's where the big bucks are, frankly. Um, so that's been a lot of the motivation of spending time also in governments. So for example, in Germany, one of the things that I'm very excited about, and it's related to some of, to, the, to this work, was an, uh, being an advisor to an effort now to stand up what they call the Digital Academy in Germany, which is a free program to train the whole of the public sector. And they use it in English. They call it New Work uh, and, uh, in English. Um, in new ways of working. How do I use data? How do I use human-centered design? How do I use community engagement? There has been an articulation uh, from on high to say, we want the public sector to change how we do things, to be more engaged, to be more data-driven, to be more agile, and a recognition that people are not going to just get there by themselves. Um, they have to actually receive training in how they do that. So they've created this digital academy and training has become a centerpiece of the government strategy um, for how to achieve better governance in Germany. I wanna contrast that to the United States where although the, the government here is the largest employer in the country, we have no training strategy. We do not have a training academy. We do not provide free training to people in government. At the federal level, the Office of Personnel Management does provide training. If you wanna take a course in human-centered design, it'll cost you $3,000. So maybe you have a budget in your agency to pay for that, but in all likelihood you don't because no one has thought to set aside the money for training. So the uptake of those resources is very limited. And no one has said, Biden is putting out uh, executive orders about equity, but no one has stopped to say, do people in government actually know what it means to do equitable engagement? And I would argue that they don't. It's why one of the projects my center has, is doing is to create an equitable engagement lab where what we do is we teach people how to do equitable engagement and we provide them with platforms, including platforms built in Iceland, I might add. So uh, we'll make sure that you get connected to those people because they're building some great stuff there. Um, we don't have to build the tools anymore. In the beginning of my career, I spent a lot of time building the tools. I don't have to do that because um, the tools are there, but the know-how about how to use them is still limited because I'm guessing that there is no one on this call who either in their undergraduate or graduate education um, learned necessarily how do I actually, you know, and, and surely people in government today haven't been trained in how do I define a problem? How do I do that with data? How do I sit down with a community? In New Jersey, I see with my own team who are trained in these methods, a lot of what we do is to train other people in what it means to do human-centered design. So for example, uh, tomorrow, not to scoop myself, but uh, tomorrow there'll be a press release about transgender.nj.gov, a new website that the team built. Um, and they did it by sitting down with members of the transgender community to understand what their needs were before building that service. Um, and there's an ongoing sort of focus group, if you will, of individuals who are participating. There's a place where you can give feedback on the site, et cetera. So it's just a different way of doing things. It's also different in that the project is very much just a first stage project. And it's being announced as we're launching it today and we're going to improve it three weeks from now and another six weeks from now, which is just different from how things have been done in the past. But people aren't born with the skills for how to do that. And it needs to be taught and it's going to eventually find its way into how we're training people in college and in graduate schools. But in the meantime, we also need to think about professional education. And let me just stop talking here for a second by saying it's not just for people in government. I think this idea of learning how do I get more effective at solving problems with communities is something that is useful for everybody to learn. Indeed. So uh, I want to remind people that we're coming up to the Q&A portion of the discussion. So please uh, enter your questions into uh, into the Q&A or into the chat. Sorry. Um, 
But, uh, I, I, you know, now that you've started talking about technology in a somewhat more central way, I, I'm afraid I have a question for you that uh, I, I may be on other people's minds because it's in the news a lot. And that is, you know, what's happening with AI and you know, there's a lot of concern. There was always a lot of concern about, you know, the prospects for disinformation and things like that. But, you know, now you've got a lot of pretty distinguished people in this world saying, maybe we should pause. I mean, it, it, it's kind of a shocking thing to me in a way that this group of people has said, you know, they're, suffic they're, they're sufficiently worried about our ability to kind of regulate these technologies uh in the in a way that makes them good for everybody uh you know that all these people are signing this document and saying that we should sort of have a pause for developing this stuff and that there's this breakneck competition to you know to improve it and all these things so uh you know you surely understand these technologies better than i do but the question really is of course about the social relevant social uh you know place of these technologies in our lives and since you you know understandably think it's you know these technologies can be used for for good purposes um and surely that's true of ai and all these things i just wonder you know how you react to what's going on in this uh in this area um well this is the next book uh i hope um I mean, so I'll, <laughs> part of my 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 sighing here is uh, I think a lot of us are facing. I would I I have a it's just the complete level of overwhelmedness. Is that a word? Um, by uh, just the volume of of commentary about AI coming at us. Um, I just got added to a group called AI Chatter a WhatsApp group. And it is probably like it, you can, it's every five minutes, something is going by on this listserv. Um, so at some level for people who are interested in this topic of technology, uh, it's, it is an overwhelming moment. But when I t catch my breath after, you know, drowning under the latest large language model and, you know, this GPT and that chat and the other thing, uh, fundamentally, and all of the discussions about will the robots eat our jobs and general purpose AI and the singularity and will is it the end of humanity and will robots take over the world and all of that. Um, I am more dismayed about the lack of focus on the use of technology for social good and for democracy. I am actually more concerned that we are spending so much airtime on talking about abuses and talking about the parade of horribles that we are uh, not spending and not spending our time on all the ways that we can do good with these amazing tools. So I've been invoking Iceland a lot, so I'll go back to them for a moment. Citizens Foundation in Iceland, which builds open source free tools for democratic engagement, um, has already integrated chat GPT into their primary platform called Your Priorities, which has been used for 20,000 different resident engagements around the world uh, to uh, help, for example, people who are on the site use ChatGPT to summarize everything that everybody's saying on the site. So you can have a conversation at great volume with lots of people talking, and these tools actually enable you to get a handle of what's going on. They enable ordinary people, especially people who may not speak the language. Let's imagine you're a migrant. You decide, John, you're going to stay in Iceland for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's beautiful, so could happen. Icelandic is not so easy to master, <laughs> nor should you. Um, Don't worry, they all speak English. They all speak English, and moreover, ChatGPT spells Icel speaks Icelandic, so... Um, they're working on a project to preserve the language with the with the government there, but they're also make it possible for you then to uh, translate what people are saying. The Google Google Translate, which is also an AI algorithm, um, uses machine learning and natural language processing to help you do just that. So it enables people though to not only to translate from one language to another, but maybe I'm not the world's best speaker. I don't know how to express what I want to say. 
uh, these large language model tools are wonderful for actually helping you to compose what you want to say. Or let me give you another example. I was on a webinar a few weeks ago with the ABA and a group of very distinguished law professors all talking about the question of citizen engagement in regulatory rulemaking. Some people here may know that since 1946, Americans have had a right, anybody has had a right, but in American law has codified the right to comment on draft rulemakings before federal agencies, before regulations are enacted. So AI has already been put to use, for example, to make it possible for the people writing the rules to reduce duplication in the comments they're seeing. Because what happens is interest groups tell everybody, go to FCC.gov and tell them why you don't want net neutrality or go to this agency and tell them why you want snowmobiling in public parks, or go to this agency and tell them why you want them to the DOT and tell them why you want to increase fuel efficiency standards or reduce fuel efficiency standards and people hit the send key 10,000 times in electronic comment, it suddenly becomes possible using AI to actually make sense of the comments so that people can actually be heard. Because without these tools, you have 20 million comments, it becomes very hard to sift the noise, the signal for the noise, and therefore people who actually have something meaningful to say get lost. Um, so these are just a few examples of the myriad ways in which we can use these tools for engagement. And these are just today's uses that are very mundane. I'm not even talking about reimagining as Sam Altman, the CEO of, of OpenAI has already talked about the idea of creating a global constitutional convention around the uses of AI. Um, that's something you can only do with AI tools. And I could go on in terms of the examples, both mundane and then imaginative for tomorrow about the ways in which we might address the challenges of our democracy, foster more participatory democracy precisely using these tools. And that's not to mention the lit examples I could give you about the ways in which, for example, we are now using AI to sift through um, pharmacological combinations to identify promising drugs to treat X disease or Y disease or use AI to sort through lots of data to optimize how we do public Can anyone hear me? Yeah, so Beth, I can hear you, but I don't know, something happened, right? Um, Beth has frozen. Exactly, yes. Uh, yeah, she's probably unplugged and we'll come back. There she is. I have can to you... say, uh, AI, I can deal with the Wi-Fi, the Northeastern Wi-Fi. This problem I cannot solve. <laughs> I'm sorry to sorry hear that. that. That's okay. Uh, I, I don't know exactly where to say you cut out, but you know, it was not that I, long. I, it was, it was enough. I said that yeah. we can use AI to fix the problems of our democracy right. and right. Uh, we should be spending more time talking about it or yes. AI on fixing, fixing my Wi-Fi would be better, right. but. Uh, right. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for those, you know, thoughts. And uh, I guess I'd like to open it up now to questions. And there are a few in the chat. So let me uh, read this first one to you. Um, this came, you know, early on in your in your comments. So it reflects, uh, you know, an early part of the discussion. Uh, Deborah Martin says, people and data is right. That said, government and NGOs rarely have resources to create the evaluation frameworks or fund related uh, longitudinal studies that would conclusively support a proposal to try something new. How can we encourage experimentation and prototyping without requiring a level of data that may not exist yet? Is there a place for qualitative data? This problem is especially true for quote, wicked problems. I don't know if that's a Boston locution or what, but um, which have many inputs and drivers. I, remember I was sent a I was sent a, a a picture today. Apparently, Link NYC is now showing a cartoon which or a, 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 a the statement which says, "In New York, we get more done before eight a.m. than Boston gets done in a day." So, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 
uh, having uh, government having a sense of humor is another new development, by the way, in terms of how institutions are functioning. But that's a topic mm -hmm. for another time. Mm -hmm. um, so, first of all, there is a huge amount of data now available that hasn't been available before. Uh, I think, you know, governments have not only governments have legal mandates to open up data, um, but increasingly I see companies interested in sharing data for public good for a variety of reasons. You know, they keep most things proprietary, um, but there's a lot of data that people want to share, whether fully openly or with accredited researchers um, for a variety of reasons. It includes wanting to do good in the world, but it sometimes includes just, you know, whitewashing their reputations and doing something good in order to overcome the bad things that they're doing, but it's often to identify talented individuals who know how to work with that data. So I don't want to discount that there is a tremendous amount of data available and more than there ever was before, but truly not enough. But data by itself is not enough. Uh, and there's absolutely a thousand percent, I agree with the comment that qualitative um, data is essential um, because data gives us a sort of 10,000 foot view of a problem, again, or a systemic view, which again, very useful for spotting trends, et cetera. But if I really want to understand the intensity with which people experience a problem, what a problem means to them, uh, how much it means to them, that only comes with qualitative conversations with people. Um, and I think the two go very much together. Um, so it's another big bugbear of mine that both in universities, but also to the extent to which governments are changing how they train people, I see a lot of adoption of one method over the other. It's been a real interest in human-centered design and teaching public servants how to interview people without teaching them complementary data analysis skills. So how do I look at data sets to complement what I'm learning from talking to people. And similarly, you see a lot of the opposite, which is emphasis on data or on tech um, because it's considered simpler or easier or neater and much less messy than actually going out and talking to ordinary people, um, especially to the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. So uh, I'm not sure if I have gone off on a tangent now and not fully answered the question, but I, to the extent to which it was about the importance of qualitative um, contributions, and I think absolutely. Great. And, again, so, and just, uh, John, just so you know, I can't see the questions anymore because since I dropped, I lost the chat. So I, I will depend on you to either read uh, them or other people okay. to read them or oh. we can paste them back in. Okay. So, I mean, you've written, just mentioned universities and Lea Diaz, who, as you say, was important in getting this uh, event together. Uh, says, you have mentioned the efforts to adapt the curriculum to this way of solving public problems. How have universities been doing in this respect? And are universities preparing the leaders of the future effectively? Big question. So I would argue no. Um, and I do think, I mean, I, I think it's changing, let me say. I, I think it's already changed in the last few years. I've been interested in people's reflections here. Um, I do think that the, uh, I know that my own university, for example, has pivoted very heavily to focusing on a mandate around solving real world problems. Um, our provost now says he will only support research that is focused on solving real world problems where people have to define the problem that they're solving. Um, I'd like to see them move towards, which they haven't yet, saying we're going to define that problem with the communities that are affected. Um, but I think there's already a lot of uh, people who are who are keen on that. But I but I would love to see universities uh, in the same way that we have seen this headlong rush towards entrepreneurship in the last generation. Both because there's demand from students, there used to be demand to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, and also I think because universities want students to become the next Mark Zuckerberg who will then donate back to universities. That's my cynical uh, view of it. Um, but I do think that uh, there's a lot of demand now and interest uh, to push towards more learning around confronting societal challenges. I see my colleague Henry is here with us. Um, and uh, uh, he's probably laughing right now because we are engaged. He's leading an effort 
to try to marshal faculty teaching courses around real world problem solving. And when we went out and asked deans, tell us what courses and what faculty are in your college that are addressing real world problems, it, it surprised me how difficult an ask that was. Um, you know, the, again, the faculty are there, people are doing the work, but there was not a lot of institutional understanding initially about what that might actually mean um, and how we can move towards uh, really hands-on learning. Um, this place is very much focused on experiential learning. So I think the shift has been very accelerated, um, but, but there's, I'm seeing it more and more at other universities, uh, including where I used to be in terms of just an interest in recentering the education uh, because I think there's so much demand from students. And I think the skills are so transferable. The skill that can help you learn, how do I um, figure out how to take the trash out in New York City to avoid the rats is something that's gonna help you um, solve a problem and manage a project in a company just as well as it is in a government. Great, thanks. So Ugo Barica, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, asks, is there a resource for the equitable engagement toolkit you've developed, something shareable? Yes. So first of all, all of the, I took two things. Um, one is uh, everything, the sort of, I've tried to summarize the whole book uh, in shorter than we've done here uh, in a, at a site called solvingpublicproblems.org, which I'll try to put in the chat right now. And then the, um, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Henry. Um, so where we have videos, including videos about how to engage with people. We also have another project that's focused specifically on training people in the public sector called Innovate US, where we've created training materials very much aimed at the public sector with a very heavy, heavy emphasis there on equitable engagement. Um, and then this new Equitable Engagement Lab project is now working with, we have a, we have, we could also put up Henry collectiveintelligence.org as well, which is a whole lot of case studies, but we're trying to, we have created a lot of stuff in the space that so we're trying to systematize it a little more and put out some more things under this Equitable Engagement Lab banner in short order. So happy to, if somebody emails me, I'm happy to share additional resources as well. Great, thanks very much. So Maria Brunette, Brunette uh, asks, in the public health field, these issues are all considered uh, to be in community-based participatory research, CBPR, uh, research platforms, where the goal is to truly engage communities and key stakeholders in co-designing meaningful slash impactful solutions uh, without ignoring the importance of shared decision-making and cultural humility. So it's sort of a comment more than a question, but maybe you could comment on the comment. Yeah, I think there is a huge amount of learning in community-based research, community-based participatory research in public health and in other domains uh, uh, without, that goes without saying. Um, what I see, so for example, some of the work we're doing now is with a whole group of organizations, all of whom do nothing but engagement. So the great part is we don't have to persuade anybody about the value of engagement. What I see though, is that um, it's still hard for people to know how to do that using available tools. Um, so a lot of what we're focused on is how do we use technology to make it more scalable or to make the learnings faster or to help translate insights into action. Um, but I think absolutely we're learning from you know, other disciplines that have long practiced uh, especially qualitative engagement with communities in how they do things um, and really borrowing a lot of those practices and bringing them into institutions is the other thing. Um, so whereas we may have this in among researchers in public health or in sociology and other fields, bringing that then into government and how government designs and does services or into companies and how they work, um, there's still a lot of cross-pollination and learning that I think can be very helpful. Right. So uh, Abdul Kafid Toko Kutogi, I'm sure I butchered that name, but I hope that's close, uh, says, I have always wondered with which of the two profiles, state officials or people outside the administrative machine, the public pro problem solving methodology can have a real impact in the community. Do you have an idea? I think um, you do have an idea. 
<laughs> Wait, say the just say the last sentence again. Where so, I hear the so, last bit of that. So uh, I think it's about you know which of the groups that we talked about at one point the the approach to your approach to uh, problem solving primarily addresses um, state officials or people outside mm -hmm. the administrative machine. Am I allowed to say both? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, so I, I really do think it's both. Um, and again, I know this from teaching students uh, for uh, some time now, a lot of these skills uh, and seeing how, uh, uh, again, how helpful the response is, how even, and, you know, um, I'm sorry, we don't, we're, we're almost out of time, so I don't have time to bring Henry into this conversation, but he could tell you about the students that we've worked with who have been able as a result of being given some training in skills uh, around real world problem solving have been able to design and then implement projects that they care about in communities. Um, and, and it's that emphasis on implementation that's so important. And again, there's, um, I'm not the first person to talk about the importance of implementation, and there have been scholars of public administration who have written a great deal about the importance of execution and implementation and delivery. The British like to call it deliverology, um, just sort of how do we get stuff done? So I think that helping people to get beyond the idea, and there's so much emphasis now on coming up with the idea, you know, let's go to a hackathon and we'll come up with an idea for how to do things, or let's have a competition and we'll come up with ideas for how to do things. It neglects the rather mundane, uh, undistinguished and dull, you know, unsexy bit, which is then getting it over the hump to implementation, which can all, which again, doesn't have the sexiness of just the idea, but it's extraordinarily important, right? I can invent a vaccine for COVID, but if I can't get it into people's arms, if I can't create a system to schedule people to actually get their vaccinations um, and ensure that it's delivered to them, uh, it's not, it's the tree falling in the forest. And so that training about how do I speed up the pathway and make it more engaged and therefore more legitimate with communities to actually deliver something, not just come up with ideas, I think is something universally valuable. But I am extraordinarily biased. Hopefully I've convinced you a little bit of that case. Um, but I'm happy to again share some other resources that are much shorter and freer than uh, than this uh, big academic book um, that try to make that case for why it's for why it's useful for people to know how to do this because I think it helps us each to become more powerful in our daily lives and enable us to be able to take projects forward from again from idea to implementation. Right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk about all this. It's been very interesting and uh, encouraging and, op op you know, optimism providing. So it's been great to have uh, Beth Novak with us. Beth Novak is professor at uh, politics at uh, Northeastern University, where she directs the Burns Center for Social Change and its partner project, the Governance Lab. She's the author of uh, Solving Public Problems, How to Fix Our Government and Change Our World from Yale University Press in 2021. And you should go out and check it out. Uh, my name is John Torpy. I want to thank Meryl Sovner and Leah Diaz, our visiting scholar, uh, for helping make this uh, possible and putting it together. And uh, I'm from the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center and look forward to seeing you uh, at our next event. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Meryl. Bye, everybody.